I've had a very profound insight into what you're saying, and, and I've got to go home and think about this, but I should say to the audience that the reason you're here in Canada right now is uh, you've come over in, in association with um, a foundation or an organization uh, whose leader is uh, Krishnamurti. And uh, in my mind, again, as a layperson, Krishnamurti I would associate with, um, well, a, a religious or a spiritual uh, group. And I'm wondering what a physicist, a theoretical physicist, mm -hmm. is doing with uh, this particular organization. Yeah, well, this is a long and a good question. It requires a rather long answer, I'm afraid. It's OK. <laughs> uh, the, uh, see, first of all, I, don't, I think that my own interest in science, and many of them interest in science, is not entirely separate from what is behind the interest in religion or in philosophy. That is to understand the whole of the universe, the whole of matter, you know, wh wh how we originate and, and so on. And uh, I think that was Einstein's w interest, for example, that he felt that um, even that it was, a, uh, he had some notion of a non-personal God who, uh, who, who had created this universe, or which had created the universe, <laughs> that, he would, that man would somehow understand the plan on which it was created. But, I'm not sure I share exactly Einstein's view, but I wanted to give it. Now, the, uh, uh, now also, I, when I was younger, I felt that in the beginning that science would surely be a, a source of benefiting mankind. And, uh, <laughs> I had no question about it. But as things went on, I found that it wasn't doing that, <laughs> you know, uh, um, that it was causing a lot of problems, which uh, you know, made many things worse. Some things were made better, but many other things were made worse. Now, and, uh, uh, I began to feel that something beyond science would be needed uh, to approach this question. You see, that, that um, people, science alone could not guarantee that it would be used for benefiting mankind, the scientific impulse. Though in the beginning I thought it would, just truth alone. Right? Then uh, uh, I began to look into philosophy and uh, Eastern and Western and so on, and some people with religious ideas. I mean, just simply looking at it when I was in Bristol in England and we were my wife and I used to go to the public library and she discovered a book by Krishnamurti and she read in there the words of the observer and the observed and I had been interested in that because in quantum mechanics that is a key question in the sense that because of this undivided wholeness the two cannot be separated and so she assumed that this was a form of quantum mechanics and, <laughs> <laughs> and she showed me the book but I found no I became very interested in the book and uh, which I felt um, opened up many new things and I finally I wrote to the publisher and found out where Krishnamurti was and we met and had discussions and you know after that uh, I began to become more closely associated with him and his work. Now uh, essentially uh, the point made by Krishnamurti was that the problems of mankind originate in thought itself, in consciousness itself you see. Uh, and as previous to that, you know, I had grown up believing that poverty was the main problem of mankind, and science would help me eliminate that. And I could see that it, no matter how far science went, it probably wouldn't, and even if it did, it wouldn't uh, really solve, it wouldn't really make mankind happy. <laughs> but, you know, we're always teaching our children that the, m the more rational we are, the more knowledge we have, the more we think, yeah. the, the better we'll be able to solve our problems. Well, I, I think what Krishnamurti made clear was we are going to be incapable of that rationality until we go much more deeply into ourselves. That, if true, if we were really rational, it would solve these problems, but we cannot be that rational. <laughs> that we may be very rational in working out some problem in nuclear physics, but we cannot be rational in how we apply nuclear physics. For example, we've used it destructively. We can now overkill the population of the world I don't know how many times, and uh, we also have destroyed the environment, and we have produced uh, destruction of natural resources, shortages such as the oil shortage and thousands of other problems uh, because of the basic irrationality, the, the, the irrational ends toward which we apply our discoveries. Okay, I can understand that, but where do we, uh, 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 again, where, how, does, how do we get that link? It seems to me that science is one thing that you've done. Krishnamurti's ideas on the world and the problems is another. Is there a link that, that connects yeah, the two? Yes, you see, I, the link is that thought itself and consciousness is caught in a certain irrationality, a certain um, disorder, confusion. When that thought, uh, thought is conditioned. You see, we, we ordinarily think that our thought is free, that we can just be free to think what is true. Right? 
but we're not that free because everything that happens is recorded in the brain, actually materially. You know, we could almost think of a tape recording. And this record is replayed as a set of in, um, instructions, you could all, uh, similar to a computer program that makes us act in certain ways, to think, feel, and act in certain ways. So we may think that a certain thing is true just because it's on the program, and we act accordingly, according to that program, right? Now, see, that program is put in very early, uh, not merely the useful things like language and techniques and all that, but also all sorts of prejudices and hopes and fears and beliefs. And, uh, and now that program uh, gives rise to many irrationalities. For example, there's desire, you see. We are moved by desire, you see. Now, desire, Krishnamurti, comes from the program. Now, we've distinguished desire and true passion, which is a tremendous energy that is creative. Uh, desire is programmed, and what you really want out of desire is something, some sort of state of perfection of consciousness. You want everything to be happy and good and right and orderly and uh, harmonious and everything just right, you see. <laughs> and that's the ultimate aim of desire. Now, the object of desire is not really desired at all. It's merely a means to the end, which is the state of consciousness, right? So we go through one object after another, seeking this uh, state, and it doesn't work. Now. It's not merely that disappointment arises in there, but desire creates self-deception. That is, the quickest way to satisfy desire momentarily is to engage in wishful thinking. That is, to arrange your ideas according to what you desire, you see. So I think that this self-deception, I've observed, is one of the major components of human thought. That is, most thought is self-deception. In fact, the dominant thought is almost always self-deception, however rational you may be in applying your techniques. The end is always determined by self-deceptive thought. Can you give us an example uh, well, of how I, that would work? Yes, well, I'll give you an example of self-deception first. I take flattery. You see, a person may have been hurt as a child and loses confidence in himself. It's on the program. The program is always demanding overcoming that, so anybody who tells him he is good and right and, and so on is believed to be true. <laughs> he can do anything, right? And everybody is seeking flattery and becoming very uh, annoyed with insults and getting angry. and. Also, people get angry, say, for not just for a second, as young children do, but for years and even, say, hundreds of years with, you know, nations fighting each other, like the or like Northern and Southern Irish and so on. And it all goes on the program, you see, generation after generation. Uh, now, so you can see that, uh, see, people have, what do they want out of life? Their supreme value. You see, some people want money, some people want power, some people want security, right? Well, they will believe anything which they think will aim, which will aid that aim. You see that uh, you can see the kind of self-deception that goes on, for example, about the oil shortage. It was known, say, in 1960 that there was going to be one. Nobody did anything about it. It became gla glaringly obvious in 1973, and since that period, nothing has been done about it. And people are still saying that it's a, a, a story invented by the oil companies <laughs> to raise prices, you see, which... Uh, <laughs> And because they uh, it feels better to believe that. They'd rather they, believe they're going to still have their cars. And, yeah, uh, that, that it's all going to be work, work out, you see. Now, what does Krishnamurti offer as, uh, as uh, far as dealing with that self-deception? Uh, well, the, the, what Krishnamurti is suggesting is that we have got to somehow get at that program, you see. Now, that is not easy to get at because, you see, the program is recorded in the brain cells somehow, not exactly known how, and we have no... In organs inside the brain are, are nerves to tell us what the, those programs are doing, right? You can even cut into the brain and not feel anything, right? All our senses come, all our sensations come from nerves that are connected to sense organs, right? Now, uh, what Krishnamurti proposes is there is nevertheless a way to be aware of that program, uh, to be, give it attention, as we give attention to an object outside. You see, it's, the program is a material structure as this is, but one is inside, the other is outside. This thing outside, we don't depend only on memory to know what it is, but our senses also tell us something directly, right? So our thought is informed by the senses. Now, when it comes to looking inside, we haven't got any real senses, and we t depend mostly on memory, which tells us nothing because it's just the program speaking. <laughs> so what, what we can do is to observe this program reflected in two ways. We make a mirror, both in our re relationships with others, which will show us our programs, and then also watching the feelings which those programs are producing in ourselves, like the fear, anger, you know, all the sensations all over the body, seeing the connection between thought and that uh, state of uh, sensation and feeling and bodily action. 
Hey, for example, if you're frightened, you see the whole body is tense, the heart beats faster, you may feel a sinking sensation in the stomach, and you say, I am afraid. Now, that is the mistake. You see, you don't see that, generally speaking, any sustained fear is part of the fear program. <laughs> but you can actually see it and if you really give it your attention and really work hard at it and see that uh, <clears throat> there's a connection between a certain thought and a certain fear or anger or pleasure or pain or sorrow or whatnot, right? And now, therefore, that, th those feelings become the mirror of your program. Now, with, if, with all of this, what are you saying that's much different from what a psychotherapy is in, in North America? I mean, well, they don't tell you to do this at all, you see, uh, I don't... I thought you look at yourself and you try well, to They don't tell you what, what mean, to I look I at, you see. Uh, you see, for example, they may tell you to go back to your past and uh, find the incident which produced this thing, but that won't change the program, right? Now, if they tell you to look at yourself, they're not telling you what to look at. You see, uh, uh, if I say look at yourself, what are you going to look at? I mean, you know, you, you could say, I see that I'm, uh, I'm um, you know, in trouble on certain points, but I feel certain feelings which are me, right? See, they accept the ego, and once you accept the ego, there is no way out. You see, they accept the, rea the ultimate reality of the ego as the physicist uh, is looking for the ultimate particle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of right. saying the ego is nothing but a structure in the whole, which can come and go, right? Now, the... Uh, if you say these feelings of anger, let's say you're angry, right? Somebody has said something to you, he's hurt you, and you're angry. Now you say, this anger is me, being angry, and therefore my problem is either I must show the anger is justified, right? I think the anger is justified, or I say I shouldn't be angry. Well, both of those are merely modifications of the program. You see, you're merely, your thought comes from the program, like the computer, so your thought says, I'm this anger is justified and you go on with it, or your thought says it's not justified and I shouldn't go on with it. But that. you haven't dealt with the fundamental question of being angry? No, because it's on the program. See, if you had a machine which was angry, see, programmed to be angry, now you could put on another program, don't be angry, and they would <laughs> just be fighting each other. <laughs> or you could put on a program saying it's perfectly all right to go on being angry. <laughs> okay, once you have that perception, though, that, that you're not dealing with it properly, Yes. Uh, if you just, uh, if you try to rationalize it or understand it, then what do you do at that point? Well, you see, what you have to do is to touch the actual material process of the program, right? Right. Now, see, awareness can touch that, you see. You see that, when, for example, in Ella, see, this program is nonsense, really. Is that clear? Uh, some programs make sense, but this one doesn't. Now, generally, when you see nonsense in a simple affair, it, it loses its power over you, you see. If you said, I thought I was going north, and I see I'm actually going south, and you say, I don't feel an impulse to keep on going north, right? But you see, if you're angry and you're, you can see that this thing is leading you into all sorts of nonsense, but you find you can't stop it hmm? because you haven't got to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can really see this thing at work to see it is actually originating from memory, producing that feeling, then it becomes plain that it's nonsense, that there's no point to, the, uh, to just keeping this machinery going. <laughs> and and uh, in a sense, that program then is erased. Or it's made null and void, right? or erased, I don't know. Have you, you would, actually but, experienced oh, that? Yeah, yes, I can see it. Now, you see, it requires that you keep on giving it attention. You see, you, there's no guarantee that it won't, ha won't happen again, but when you understand what's involved, you see, you can do, go into it each time <coughs> and when you've seen the basic point. Now, the problem for me, I guess, is that I can understand that in terms of dealing with individuals, with people... <coughs> who come within your own sphere so that you can touch and, and interact with them. Mm -hmm. This is a very important uh, kind of insight to have. Meanwhile, though, the world is rushing by. All sorts of terrible things are, uh, are happening at the level of nations and, and uh, groups of nations and so on. I mean, does this kind of insight have any relevance to the the great global forces yeah. that, uh, that threaten our very existence. Well, in two ways. You see, first of all, the source of this global force is exactly the same as the source of what happens in the individual. That is the collective programs, right? That if they aren't changed, nothing, will, nothing can be done. You see, people have tried by every means imaginable, by religion, by science, by politics, to change this, and nothing has happened, right? It has gone on much the same huh? over thousands of years. Now. Uh, somehow, that is not going to change fundamentally unless you get at the root of it. Now, as they see, the, the society has basically, 
is that basically identical with the individual at this deep root, right? The society is nothing but the totality of individuals who are caught in this, who are in turn reinforcing each other. And so we first of all have to understand where the, what the problem is, because we may be just following a false hope by hoping that we're going to straighten it out in some other way. I mean, it may produce a momentary improvement, but it cannot really get rid of it. Now, uh, the second point is how that we cannot directly affect that thing. It's like, you know, almost like Niagara Falls, right? <laughs> it's going on its right, own way. Right, right. And uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, there may be a way in the sense that if we had, uh, see, each person who understands this in some way has removed himself from it. He's not adding to it. But also, I think that if we could get a considerable number of people who are doing this, who are able to do this, they would be able to really think together. See, ordinarily people can't think together. Each one has his own opinion, which is re based on his own conditioning. And people really pay very little attention to each other <laughs> when they try to think together. Right? Now, if, say, a large, consider, say, a 10 or 20 or 30 people could really think together with one mind, I think they would liberate a tremendous energy which would affect the others not perhaps in, finally in the sense of getting rid of the whole problem, but at least diverting. It would make possible a diversion of the present stream to something less dangerous. You see, I think a few... What makes you think there's that much energy in just a, a small number of people? I think there's tremendous that? energy in people, but they don't allow it to develop, you see, unfold. That, uh, see, I, Krishnamurti likes to give various examples, like saying per, people like Hitler and Stalin have had tremendous energy although they used it, no, it was done with evil purposes and so on, but uh, a few people can give a tremendous impetus to the whole of society. And I think if somebody like Toynbee once said, you know, that in the beginning, each civilization begins with a few people of very high energy who get things started, and it sort of rises up to the top and then falls because the energy gets lost. And I, the way I would say the energy gets lost is that the civilization accumulates traditions which are... Con accumulated in the brain cells and gradually the brain cells fill up with programs and people can't uh, do anything new, right? So the civilization dies. Now, so I think that uh, you can see now that very few leaders, for example, have any energy. You see, I, I, one looks at the politicians and say they're just repeating the same old story, though everybody can, anybody should be able to see that none of the things they propose is going to work. <laughs> That we well, are. you're right on. We're running in a Canadian election right now. You're <laughs> right on, yes. <laughs> uh, well, that somehow, some source of uh, new ideas is needed of a much higher energy, uh, something both original and very uh, full of energy and passion, and uh, um, which would be relevant to the actual problems. And I think that that would actually... I think if people could see that there was something which would really be relevant to the problems and would divert us from this disaster we're approaching, it would take hold. David Bohm, unfortunately we've run out of time and we've barely skimmed the surface. I, I you know, I always uh, am very concerned about the electronic media because of the superficiality mm -hmm. of the whole thing and I think what we're showing right now is that uh, we've barely begun to penetrate your mind to share some of these ideas and uh, I'm just sorry we don't have more time. Thank you very much for coming here.